Good afternoon. My name is Debbie Miller, and I am a JDC board member and chair of the JDC Archives Committee. I am pleased to welcome you today to today's webinar on Joseph Schwartz, who was really a JDC hero and worked in Europe during World War II. We are thrilled that so many of you have joined on this afternoon to hear more about the role in rescuing Jews during the Holocaust. First, a few words about JDC. The JDC archives, which houses the records of JDC since its creation 107 years ago, is one of the most important repositories in the world for the study of modern Jewish history. Visiting scholars from around the world utilize our unique offerings for their research. We also offer fellowships to enable scholars to conduct research in the JDC archives. I also want to warmly welcome and thank our co-sponsors, the Jewish Book Council. The Jewish Book Council is a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating and enriching the community through Jewish literature, strengthening connections to Jewish life and identity, and inspiring conversations between generations of readers. Our speaker today, Tuvia Frilling, is an emeritus professor at the Ben Gear Gurion University in the Negev. Professor Frilling previously headed the Ben Gurion Institute between 1993 and 2001 and was the state archivist of Israel between 2001 and 2004. In 2003, Tuvia served as one of three vice chairs of the International Commission on the Holocaust in Romania headed by Professor Elie Wiesel. Professor Frilling was awarded by the President and Government of Romania the President Award of Cultural Merit in Rank of Commander. His publications include Arrow in the Dark, David Ben-Gurion, The Yeshuv Leadership and Rescue Attempts During the Holocaust, A Story of a Capo in Auschwitz, History, Memory, and Politics, and today, Professor Frilling will give a lecture based on his forthcoming book in Hebrew, The Web Spinner, Dr. Joseph Joe Schwartz and the JDC, Aid and Rescue Operations During World War II and Its Aftermath, an operational biography. Our format is that our guest speaker will speak for about 45 minutes, then we will entertain questions. Please, Note that your microphones are turned off and we will take questions via the Q&A function. You can send us questions at any time during the lecture. Tuvia Frilling will now start his lecture. Thank you very much for your kind words. It's an honor and pleasure to be with you today. This lecture is based on my book about to be published soon an operation biography in which the figure of its hero is carved out from his actions in three main cycles of operation. About 11 years at the JDC, most of them as the director of the European theater and its director of operation with ties to almost all continents. About five years in the United Jewish Appeal, about 15 years in the Israeli bonds. Due to the time limits, I will focus, and that too in a nutshell, on Schwartz's time at the JDC, even though in his other two, his activity was closely tied to the essential and abundant assistance that American Jewry extended to what was, after all, the only answer that seems practical at that time and circumstances to the collapse of the emancipatory idea into itself a collapse of which the Holocaust was a supreme expression and the nation state for the Jewish people in the land of Israel was both imaginary and realistic answer for most of its survivors. An answer that the Zionist movement and the JDC under the leadership of Schwartz and his partners adopted. Whether to assist these survivors, refugees and displayed person were part of what was then defined as Sherita Pleta in Europe or those who came from the various Islamic countries. Whether due to the age-long religious longing for Zion and Jerusalem, 
or the national awakening part of the feeling that the state of Israel is already standing on the brink, or whether due to the economic distress of many of them, or the sharpening of the danger of their mere existence, they are due to the nationalist and the anti-colonial wave that swept through many of their homelands. Before we turn to the story of Schwartz's extensive uh, activities, which is the main part of our story here, here are some details about him and his family. Yosef Joshua Schwartz was born on the 12th of Nissan, Tarnat, 55-59, March 23, 1899, in the city of Nova Odessa in Russia, to his father Avram Avrum Nachman Schwartz, who would later become one of the most prominent Orthodox rabbis in the United States, and to his mother, Golda Miriam, the daughter of Rabbi Elchanan Prey. He was named after a thinker and writer, Rabbi Yoshua Yosef Prey, his mother's brother. On August 2nd, 1906, Father Avram Natan immigrated to the United States, and at the end of 1906, Golda Miriam and her six children left Nova Odessa and followed him. In addition to the six children <clears throat> uh, who came into the world in the steppes of Russia, three more sisters and a brother were born in the new land. In 1915, after middle school, his father sent him to study with his brother-in-law, Rabbi Eliezer Meyopel, then the head of the theological seminary and yeshiva named after Rabbi Yitzhak El Hanan in New York, later the Yeshiva University. Yosef Yoshua was one of the best students at the Yeshiva, and at 1921, he was ordained to the rabbinate. After that, Yosef Yoshua was appointed rabbi at the Pincus Elijah Synagogue on the west side of New York. Although young rabbi Yosef Yoshua Schwartz found a wealthy and a benevolent hostel in the synagogue, he held the position for only about three years. And in 1925, he left the synagogue and turned to another and the new sphere. It can be assumed that his parents would not have known then that their son would become a significant righteous man, a big tzaddik, even if beyond the religious world. Although he did not follow his father's path, Yosef Yoshua will influence, conquer, and lead ways in another world of mitzvot and saving lives. Actions full of good, heartedness, grace, and mercy. It will be years until his family learns about his actions, the critical place he occupied in this new world, and the honor he and them will receive even though he abandoned the rabbinical world. In New York, he met Dora Ney Rashbach, a Jewish actress of Canadian origins. After a short period of courtship, the two married on March 6, 1923. The choice of a secular independent actress woman was another step from which the rabbinic family could understand that their son Yosef shows to follow a different path than intended. He then began to specialize in Mesopotamian studies at Yale University. In a little over two years, he completed his studies for a doctorate. From that point, the end of 1927, Rabbi Yosef Yoshua also became Dr. Schwartz. In addition to Paki, a name that stuck to him due to his uh, sympathy for a boxer, Paki McFarland, another American foreign endearment was added next to his name, Joe. Joe was the name by which his colleagues and staff will refer to him in the next stations of his life. Upon receiving his degree, Dr. Schwarz was awarded a prestigious research scholarship which allowed him to go to the American University in Cairo, where he served from 1928 to 1929 as an instructor in Arabic, Semitic, and language studies. In 1929, he spent several months in the Yishuv, the pre-state of Israel, most of the time in Jerusalem. 
there he met scholars who gather around the young Hebrew University. Between August 23 to 29, 1929, the Yishuv underwent a period of bloody riots, which known as Praot Tarpat, to which Vartz was also exposed. On June the 8th, 1928, while in Cairo, Nathan, the only son of Yosef and Dora, was born in Montreal, Canada, where Dora resided to be near her parents and family during the birth. After several months and following the return of his father to New York, Nathan and Dora reunited with, with Yosef. In New York, from an early age, under the direction of his artist mother, Nathan began his studies in what would develop into a successful and respectable musical career. It seems that both Nathan and his mother had no connection between their spiritual world and between the rabbinic Torah part of Rabbi Yosef Yoshua heritage. As year passed, Nathan will go farther and farther away from the remnants of the world of his father and immerse himself more and more in his world as a gifted musician. With Yosef Yoshua's now also Dr. Schwartz returned to the United States, he served as an associate professor at the University of Rhode Island teaching German literature and Semitic languages. He spent three years at the university when his chapter on this chapter of his life also ended, either because of the economic depression in the United States during those years and the deep cuts in university budgets or for other reasons. In 1931-32, Schwartz left Rhode Island and returned to New York to work in a new field at the Brooklyn Federation of Jewish Charities, where he served as the director of the public relations department. In a short time, he was absorbed into a new field, relief, aid, social work, in all its aspects. The years of the economic crisis and the effect had affected on the Jewish community. The Jewish immigration, also very limited, still posed challenges in integrating and caring for the newcomers. His qualifications and skills soon led him to the position of director of the organization he had recently joined. In this framework, he took a decisive part in uniting the two relief and assistance system of the Jews in Brooklyn and New York into one federation of Greater New York. This was the framework in which he worked for about five years until he was invited at the beginning of 1939 to work at the JDC, the period of which most of our story will focus. Yosef Yoshua Schwartz passed away on January 1st, 1975 at the age of 76. As mentioned, in 1933, Schwartz began his philanthropic work at the Federation. In 1939, at the age of 40, he started working at the JDC. In May 1940, he was sent to accompany Maurice Tropper, director of the European scene of the JDC, in a journey of monitoring the situation of European Jews. Neither Schwartz nor anyone else could have known that this journey would essentially become an apprenticeship, apprenticeship for the replacement of Tropper, and that in about three months, Schwartz would become the director of the arena, a position that would shape his life and shape a new phase in the JDC modus operandi. It seems that Schwartz galloped into his this position as if it was born in this challenging operating environment, an environment that required great resourcefulness, creativity, improvisational ability, an ability to act in an environment of uncertainty, a willingness to take risks, courage, and valor. What was the framework in which he was supposed to operate? First, Schwartz joined an organization that was already busy and reputable, organized and very professional. An organization with the work routines, transparent procedures, 
and an organized management system, a management that included a nucleus of professional employees and a board of directors comprised of major donors, many of whom were wealthy, experienced, and shrewd businessmen and women. Regional cells were scattered throughout the United States in European and South American countries. It was a well-oiled system of rich and generous philanthropic organization and also very circumspect. It was careful not to risk its realm of operation by violating the rules of the game in United States in other areas it operated. Also, the JDC was an organization that like other organizations, institutions, and movements in the Jewish world was unprepared for the unprecedented severe upheaval that World War II and the Holocaust held at them. It should be remembered that Schwarz did begin to operate in Europe when he was already at war. Although where there were still many who referred to it then as a fake, a pony war. It took time when many found it difficult to believe that in a short period, it should become the second world war, a war that included the Holocaust. It was a year before the Nazis started carrying out the last and the final stage in the implementation of the final solution in June 1941 with the Barbarossa operation. Moreover, not, not only that the United States was not yet part of the fighting force powers, but President Roosevelt also recently ran for election with isolationist slogan, he will keep us out of the war. It will need a very dramatic event and great leadership to turn to the American people and maybe to his voters and tell them that the United States must join the war against Nazism and fascism, a war of sons of light against the sons of darkness. Both JDC and Schwartz as a novice director should have been careful not to be associated with the image of the Jews as warmongers, the war as a Jewish war, and similar images that Goebbels and his propagandists spread throughout the world. Moreover, the United States has not yet recovered from the great economic crisis. Even the New Deal policy, despite its far reaching measures, failed to do so. Given the crisis, and perhaps even for other reasons, the United States still restricted immigration in large numbers and could therefore ask how can it be possible to save Jews by taking them out of, from Europe if the great and rich United States was not an option for them. It also was remembering that on the eve of the war, and in fact, from May 1939, the issue was also not an immigration option for most Jews. McDonald White Papers allocated 75,000 certificates for the next five years. The British feared the Muslim world, in fact, of a pro-Zionist policy on the eve of a possible war in, in the face of a pro-Zionist policy on the eve of a possible war in Europe, thus restricting immigration to the issue. This policy did not change throughout the war and even after it. The Vian Conference from July 39, 1938, proved correct Weizmann's sharp and sarcastic statement that the world is divided between two types of countries. Countries that do not want Jews in their domain and countries that do not want to accept more Jews in their territories. Moreover, by joining the war, the United States adopted rules of conduct of which at least three of them made the rescue of Operation Jews impossible concentration of the main military effort, prohibition of transferring money to the occupied territories, prohibition of any negotiations with Nazis of their, and their, or their emissaries. 
what were the practical ramification of each of these rules? The first, no special means or efforts for saving Jews. The solution for all the problems is winning the war, smashing Hitler and his regime. The second, how you can help and save Jews in Europe if it is forbidden to transfer American money there. The third, how one can try to save Jews if it is forbidden to negotiate with Nazis or their emissaries or pay ransom if it is forbidden to send money or money wars. Therefore, as director of Europe and de facto of North Africa, the Middle East and the Far East, Schwarz was to rescue large numbers of Jews in conditions will, which contradict the rules of the war conduct and when the two main venues of mass immigration for Jews were blocked. One by the British, which actually led the war against Hitler, and US the second, which will join the war in 19, 18 months. The same two countries which allocated huge resources and said it's sons to win the war against Hitler and his allies. And that his country, the USA, before, along and after the war, enabled his organization to, live, to develop in a vast, important, generous organization, as well as for his main donors to become rich and well established in it. If we pick, put the end of the story before the beginning, it will be said that Schwartz's main contribution to the JDC at that crucial time was in five important spheres. The first, is the sphere of consciousness. He was able to promote a profound change of perception in the management of his organization based on the understanding that if I am not for myself, who is for me? And if I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? Mishnah Masechet Avot Alef Yudalet. That saving Jews, fathers, mothers, brothers, and sisters cannot contradict, contradict the American set of values. That saving Jews does not make them better Jews. It makes them, and above all, better Americans. The second is his ability to offer a practical way to save Jews within the framework of law and the rules of the war conduct although from time to time were significantly stretched almost to the point of expiration, a practical way that will transform the organization work pattern from a philanthropic organization that deals mainly with rehabilitation and relief to an organization that practically will do everything to reach every Jew in danger anywhere at any time and by all means. A pattern and a spread de corps as was said by many, have been the JDC ever since. The third, with the understanding that such a profound, comprehensive, and fundamental ch change of mind would take long time because not all the members of the board could adapt as quickly as required by the merchant situation, it was necessary to establish an emergency cabinet within the board, a, a small group that will understand the vitality and the urgency of the change and agree with it. A cabinet which will provide the public judicial political backup for the operational forces working in the field. Backup was needed both internally, that is within the organization itself, and externally, that is toward the American authorities and anywhere else in the world where it will be necessary to act. The force to keep the JDC operating within the legal framework necessary to an American organization, Schwarz with the backing of the emergency cabinet would be acting as a pivot, coordinator, center of a nectar of various operational branches, organizations, institutions, movements, an array of sub-branches, sub-contractors, proxies, each operating in its area, each in its relative advantage field. Schwarz will be at the center and to a large 
extent be the spinner of the web. He will participate as much as possible in the steering, planning, and management of the operations of those branches and will ensure the budget, essential part of the logistical infrastructure and the international political diplomatic patronage that was required for those proxies. In any case, where the JDC cannot be identified with this activity, it will play its part in covert methods away from the spotlight without mentioning him, Schwartz, or his men. The fifth, fair, planting the recognition also in his emergency cabinet and whenever it was necessary that his senior and most important partner in the network will be the Zionist movement, the Jewish agency, the issues, other overt and covert operational arms. Thus, it will be necessary to act even if there are those in the high levels of the JDC who do not like the colors of light blue and white that have colored an important part of the organization's operation, operations and blurred its stars and stripes. This pattern of conduct became increasingly consolidated as Schwartz was absorbed in his position as the organi organization director in Europe and as mentioned with a pole of control that included almost all the continents. It became essential after the end of November 42, when the Jewish agency in Jerusalem called out at all forums that what was happening in Europe was no longer a pogrom, another act of murder, one of those in which the history of the Jewish people is embedded, but a comprehensive, systematic, industrial process of the extermination of the Jews in Europe. Schwarz continued to act in this spirit even after the end of the war, this time in a different context, although even then it became increasingly clear that the survivors, Sherita Pleta, whether the Jews who remained in their homelands or those who were def defined as displaced persons in the DP camps in Europe are trapped for the most part in a macabre situation where there is no fundamental solution to their distress. The policy proposed by Ernest Bevin and Clement Etli of repatriation, that is the return of every Jew to the land of his birth, turned out to be pointless from its inception even before Kielce. Schwartz was also the, partment, the partner of Arel Erison Truman's emissary to examine the situation of the Jews in Europe. His partner in preparation of the report submitted to the president and to the recommendation of allocating 100,000 Aliyah license to Eretz Israel. Here, once again, he presented his belief that in those circumstances, the only fundamental solution to the problem of the Jews in Europe was Aliyah immigration to Eretz Israel. Such things were also said in his testimony before the Anglo-American Commission of Inquiry. He's joining, he's joining the flight, the Bricha movement, which relocated hundreds of thousands of Jews to the shores of Southern and Eastern Europe to join the Mossad Lalia bed ships, made him once again a partner in illegal activities in Europe more than once to the chagrin of some of the heads of the JDC. This was also the case with the evacuating of Jews of North Africa, Yemen, Iran, and Iraq. In all these cases, the new operating pattern of the organization under Schwarz leadership is evident. Who were members at the emergency cabinet? Paul Brevald, Edward Warburg and other members of his family, Joseph Ayman, Moses Levitt, in certain clandestine action sedition members from the executive committee of the JDC were brought into the cycle. Who worked with Schwartz in his operational headquarters, first in Lisbon and since the liberation of France against, again in Paris, 
Herbert Katsky, Moses Bickelman, Laura Margolis, later Margolis Yarblum, Emmanuel Rosen, Israel Gaino Jacobson, Charles Jordan, and always his right hand man, Melvin Goldstein. Alongside them, JDC representative operated in most countries. Some of them were appointed before Schwartz, and some of them owned by him. Managing such overt and covert operation in a complex circumstances required courage, dedication, and ability to solve problems. They had to act under personal danger, conditions of stress, and uncertainty. Schwartz was searching for doers, those who answers were certainly, immediately, it was already done. No those who discover suddenly their life can be brutal and cruel and will collapse in the face of the first crisis. People who know how to maintain confidentiality in real time and who were willing to be humble enough not to disclose what great things they have done, even in insight. This is how Schwartz behaved and led, and this was what he demanded of them. This is also one reason why we still do not know about many of their actions. Who were the partners in that network that Schwartz spinned from the abundance of organization? Here are some of them. In France, a series of underground organizations and their union at the Nîmes conference, Schwartz's contact person was Gilles Jules Dikaya Froeking. In Portugal, from the headquarters in Lisbon, contacts with the Quakers and their subsidiary organization, the American French Service Committee, the AFSC, and their representative there, Dr. Philip Conrad, and Howard Riggins. The Unitarian Relief Service, URC, who came to Spain to treat the victims of the Civil War and now found the refugees as suitable replacement, and their representatives, Martha and White Steel Sharp, who were at their head, Dr. Charles Joy, who replaced them, and later also Dr. Robert Dexter and his wife, Elizabeth. Both Martha and White Seal Sharp were honored with the title of Righteous Among the Nations of Yad Vashem. From the beginning of 1944, Robert Dexter, who would be both the representative of the War Refugee Board in Lisbon, and Aka Korn as the representative of the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services in Lisbon, a city full of spies. The phenomena, phenomena of which people simultaneously held several positions in different organizations, some as a cover for their main activity, was not rare. Herbert Katsky was one of them. Comasis, the dedicated group from the Jewish community in Lisbon that served as an anchor to the JDC establishment there. Activists were Professor Moses Samzalag, Dr. Ugos de Asagi, the Sakera brothers, Dr. Baruel, Esther and Rafael Spanian, Ernest Levin, his wife Mazeltov, and others. Other organizations who were part of this network were Ayas and Isam, ICA, who also arrived at Lisbon in June 1940. Varian Fry and the International Relief Association. IRA, we arrived also at Lisbon in the summer of 1940. Before continuing to Marseille, Fry met with several heads of organization already located in Lisbon, including the Red Cross, the Catholic Relief Service, the AFSC, the YMCA, and ISAM. He met also with Schwartz, coordinated with him and shared ideas, tasks, and plans for rescuing the artists, intellectuals, writers, and poets. At the same time, in New York, Frank Kingdom, Fry's director, asked Joseph Hyman, a member of the Emergency Cabinet, to expand the cooperation in Marseille. In the summer of 1944, Schwarz will also meet with Leon Denenberg, 
the representative of rice organization in Istanbul, at that time, they discussed much border plans. Upon arriving in Marseille, Fry, Fry met Herbert Katsky, Schwarz representative there, and together with the team that Fry had set up, around 2,500 refugees were rescued. Fry was the first American who was honored with the title Righteous Among the Nation of Yad Vashem. Other partners were Intergovernmental Committee for Refugees, headed by James McDonald, Relico, an important partner in the Parcels Project, TOS in Poland, OZE, Infants and Children Aid Society operate almost all over Europe and North Africa, or organization operate all around the world. De La Sem in Italy, RSARO, representation in Spain of American Relief Organization, and David Blickenstaff, its head, which was Schwartz trustee. The International Red Cross and its affiliates in different countries, the Orthodox Rabbinical Council in United States, UNRWA, later IRO, that replaced it, replaced it from February 44, the War Refugee Board, and I should also mention the American ambassadors and consul in Lisbon, Madrid, London, Istanbul, Bern, and more. Some helped and even went off their way. Others piled up difficulties. Who else was part of this operational network? First, in every country where Jews survived and were active, local activity cells were recruited. This was the case, for example, with Helen Benatar, Eli Gozlan, Yaakov Laredo, and many other North African partners. Sima Spitzer in Yugoslavia, Gizzi Fleischmann and her colleague in the working group in Slovakia, Dr. Filderman in, and his partner in Romania, Daniel David Guzik in Poland, Vittorio Lelio Valobra in Italy, Joseph Bass in France, Sally Meyer in Switzerland, and such activists in Yemen, Iran, and Iraq. There were other partners at that aid and rescue group. The National Fund for Israel, Karen Kremet Israel, Karen Ayesod United Palestine Israel Appeal, World Jewish Congress, Agudat Israel, Poale Agudat Israel, Chabad, and Otsar Torah. These organizations and others all with good intentions and goodwill operating for the same ethical code will play an important role in immigration, aid, rescue, and rehabilitation matters. Even so, one of the tasks that Schwarz faced was the need to turn the competition, overt and covert hostiles, ego clashes, and mutual contradicting acts into a spearhead a synergistic force for action in favor of the persecuted. Yet, the main partners were the Zionist movement, the Jewish agency, and their operational legal and semi-legal organization, semi-military and intelligence institution. Most of them headed by Shaul Meirov, Reuven Zaslani, and others. The emissaries of the issue in Istanbul, Geneva, Stockholm, London, Lisbon, Madrid, and more during the war and after mass. The local leadership and activists of Bricha, the fleet organization, the peoples of the Haganah, the soldiers and the officers of the Jewish Brigade, the people of Mossad Le Aliyah Bet, and other delegates of parties, movements in Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. Due to the time limits, I can do no more then point out the, the presence of Schwarz and his people and partners from the bandits of this organization in a long series of actions. This is the case, for example, in the attempts to help the Jews in France through underground movements, movements to survive the Vichy period and especially at the beginning of the deportation to the camps. Thousands of Jews were smuggled from France to Spain and Portugal, and from there moved to any country that agreed to provide them with overnight shelter or permanent residence. Children were smuggled from Italy and France to Switzerland, 
from France to Italy operating with Angelo Donati, the priest Pierre Marie Vanois, Service Andre and others, or children from the Balkan states to the issue. The JDC party in the attempts to carry out a series of ransom plans to which the Jews from Europe would be bought and rescue and rescue. This included attempts to save the Romanian Jews who were deported to, the, to Transnistria to rescue Jews who were stuck in Kladovo Shabbat's convoy in Yugoslavia, to rescue the Jews of Slovakia and others through the Europa plan. Also the attempt to save the Hungarian Jews via the Joel Brand and Bondi Gross missions and a series of Air Force efforts organized through Switzerland, through Switzerland. Central, central figures who represented the JDC in such activities were Yefroikin, Fildermann, Spitzer, Gizzi Fleischmann, Valobra, Guzik, Salimayer, and others. In addition, there were huge relief projects launched with other partners from Lisbon, Tehran, Jerusalem, and Istanbul, sending parcels of food, clothing, shows, medical pro products, matzot, tefillin, talitot, and other needs for ritual, Jewish rituals. Basic supplies were sent by train wagons and trucks whenever there was slightest chance that even just a part will reach the target. Likewise, where the, op the operation to aid Jews in North Africa. This included attempts to recover property from the Nazi occupation of North Africa or assisting in immigrating to the Yishuv and later to the state of Israel. Assisting Jewish refugees, Jews who were transferred by the JDC and partners from France, Spain and Portugal to North Africa in their way either west or east. Assisting local Jews who were sent to forced labor camps. Actions in which Helen Benatar, Schwarz representative in North Africa stood out with Eli Gosland and others. Among all these were the attempt to transfer Jews to the Fadala camp in Morocco as part of the decision of the Bermuda Conference. Schwarz and his people cooperated closely with the flight movement, as I said, the Bricha, which relocated tens of thousands of Jews to launch points of the Mossad ships in southern and eastern shores of Europe. Connections included the local leadership of the Bricha, its leadership from the Yishuv, the soldiers and officers of the Jewish Brigade, and the missiles of the Yishuv from Haganah, Amosad Galia, Bet, and many more. A vast operation which Schwarz men and women, facilities, trucks, uniforms, budgets, cash money, foods, medical services, and more serve as an essential part of the system. The actions were clearly against British policy, which even then still sought to ensure the Jews stay in Europe countries. Also that they would not endanger their positions in the Muslim world, which was spread over strategic trade points, oil and political influence. We cannot begin to describe the extent of the operation of Schwarz and his men and women inside the displaced person camps in Germany and Austria. The activity in Italy and many other reception centers for Jewish refugees. Likewise, we cannot demonstrate the assistance of Schwarz and his team in evacuating the Jews from Yemen, Iraq, and Iran. They supplied all that was required to secure air transportation by various American and other airlines companies, real or shell companies that operate in cooperation with the Mossad Lelia Bet until the establishment of the state and by the Mossad after its establishment. The same goes for everything that was invested in securing the massive array of ships that were needed to evacuate the Jews from the various shores of Europe and North Africa. Airplanes and ships that were the nucleus of Shoham and Sim, the Israeli shipping companies, and the well-known El Al. 
these actions were all taken by the same leadership based on the same concept, the same method, and with the same spirit. In, a, in the summer of 1981, a Jewish American committee was established in, in United States headed by Chief Justice Arthur Goldberg. Goldberg was an OSS man during World War II. He was the head of a section for relations with social democratic movements and personalities in Europe at the OSS office in London. Together with Alan Dallas, then the head of the OSS station in Bern, he tried to recruit partners for the secret battle in Nazi Germany from among leaders, heads of trade unions, and other social democrats within Europe. It can be assumed that Chief Justice Goldberg knew something about the covert SQ actions and the dialectics of that period. The Goldberg Committee, coordinated with team led by Seymour Maxelfinger, and was designed to examine what American jury did during the Holocaust to help their brothers. A few days after its launch, a working paper that presented initial conclusion was published in the New York Times. Accordingly, the Jews of the United States and their leaders missed opportunities for saving the Jews of Europe during the Holocaust. Committee members called out that this was not a commission of inquiry, but a body whose one-sided conclusion derived from a clear ideological approach were predetermined. Consequently, several researchers withdraw from the committee and others agree to, agree to continue under the condition that Shmuel Merling, as an associate of the center and a senior member at Hillel Cook Aka Peter Bergson Group, who prepared the working paper would be removed from the committee. The harsh criticism of Bergson Group on the uh, traditional Jewish leadership in America was very known and did not leave any doubt about his intentions. It can be assumed that if the committee had been established during Schwartz's lifetime, he would have been invited to give his testimony. May you, maybe he would have presented the range of actions he did with his people with the support of the emergency, emergency cabinet in the JDC and with the cooperation of various organizations from Lisbon, Paris, Barcelona, and Madrid, Istanbul, Geneva, Jerusalem, North Africa, Tehran, Shanghai, Bucharest in Warsaw, and many other cities in Europe. And in Central and South America, in North Africa, Far East, in Aden, Iran, Iraq, in the Yishuv, and Israel during the, and after the war. He could in fact have told its members a, com a cl completely different story. The untold story of the involvement of the American jury in all these sections. As a close partner of the Zionist part uh, and part of their clandestine operation, he could establish that the claim that their ideology of the negation of the diaspora had blinded them and led them to abandon their own families facing the Nazi crematoria was completely baseless. The Shlilata Galut never turned to be Afkarata Gula. As a main figure in leading the covert operations and efforts of the JDC with other members, Jewish and not Jewish, American and others, he could assert that the perception that the American Jewry first focused on their needs, on their fears, fears of importation of anti-Semitism, paralyzed and weakened, given their fears of being accused of dual loyalty, and as such did not do all it could help to the Jews of Europe, is not less than absurd. Probably, he would suggest that if someone really wants to know more on this entangled period and its huge challenges, they should focus on research rather than being swept away by the politics 
of memory. Thank you. Tuvia, thank you so much. That was fabulous. We really, really enjoyed it. And we have several questions. So I'm going to go now to the Q&A. And I hope you'll, you'll be happy to answer some of them. The first one is from Pierre Savage. I know I've come across references to Schwartz in Varian Fry's related materials. Of course, Fry was an American rescuer in Marseille in 1940-41. What do you know about the relations between Fry and Schwartz? As I mentioned in my lecture, and I'm sorry that I cannot elaborate, uh, the organization of Fry that was a, a small organization at the beginning of his operations was well in, uh, was in a close relation with Schwartz people, with Schwartz himself and Herbert Katsky there. And their mission, as you know, was to at, at first to find a way to evacuate from Europe uh, intellectuals, writers, poets, musicians, uh, scientists, and so on. And they operated from uh, France in the time that they could operate there, and then from Istanbul and other places. And Schwarz was connected to, as I said, with Fry in, uh, in, uh, in Portugal, in France, and with the delegate of the organization, Leonard Dannenberg, in Istanbul, then in the connection, in the context of the attempts to save the, the Jews from Hungary. I, I, I just must, must give a shout out now to the Jewish Book Council because of all the books that I've read, uh, Holocaust related, and I've read many, many books about Varian Fry, never have any of these books, which are mainly historical fiction, none of them have ever mentioned Joe Schwartz, which I think is really a shame. But I urge everybody to log on to the Jewish Book Council because there's there are many, many books that I think people would find interesting. <clears throat> Varian Fry has become a friend. I've read so many things about him. The next question is from Phila, Phyllis Epstein. My father, Louis Sobel, was Dr. Schwartz's packy, packy as he was known. Um, they were best friends and worked together in Europe from 1941 to 44. Did you happen to come across any information on my father? I'm sorry that I cannot uh, give all the names of the people. There are so many people that work uh, um, as people of the JDC, as rabbis from the American army that uh, acted there of uh, local communities. So uh, I think one of the important things that we can do is to give light on these uh, heroes that uh, worked in these uh, places. Yes, I heard about uh, your father, Mr. And uh, I hope that uh, you will find his name in my book. Otherwise, he will be one of those people that I could not uh, put in my books that is already about 2,000 pages. Oh, my goodness. Okay, the next question is from um, Enid Eckstein, or Eckstein, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. My mother worked for JDC in Cairo, and in 1944, and then in Paris in 1945. Can you describe daily operations? She was a social worker. Um. You know, Cairo was a center for uh, a lot of organizations uh, from uh, intelligence bodies, military bodies, headquarters of uh, the, the British military. They should have operated there with uh, their delegates. Uh, and uh, the JDC opened an office there uh, in order to try to help from there to South Europe, the countries of South Europe. Um, they already operated in some um, some camps that were built there uh, for the people that were evac evacuated from Europe and were held there as, as I said as a, a night shelter that uh, some countries were kind enough to offer. Great. The next question is from Carol oops, Carolina Enrique. Perea, I hope I pronounced it right. Good afternoon, I'm finishing my PhD in contemporary history at Columbia University, parenthesis Portugal, and I study the presence of European refugees of World War II um, in the center of Portugal. I'm very interested in Schwartz, 
Schwartz's contribution on those aspects, especially in Lisbon. JDC, JDC Office, I have two questions. Your book will be published in English as well, and I think that's not true yet, but I don't, I'm, I don't know that. Do you know um, other documents that show jo Joseph Schwartz's humanitarian action in Portugal, in addition to those on JDC archives? Parenthesis, I are already researched on JDC archives in New York, and they were plenty of documents on his actions in Portugal. Thank you so much, best regards. This is a good opportunity for me to thank the JDC archives in uh, New York and in uh, Jerusalem. This is a real treasure for researchers. Uh, the computation system that you uh, develop there is something wonderful for research. And the answer to the young lady is yes, of course, there is a lot of materials that you can find the reference in my book, now in Hebrew. And Bezrat Hashem, as you say in uh, different places in English uh, uh, shortly. Great. This is from Jerry Muller. What was Ozar ha HaTorah shown on your map? Ozar HaTorah was one of the Jewish organizations, uh, religious, that were spread all over North Africa, mainly in uh, Mizrahi uh, uh, neighborhoods and uh, neighbors uh, environments. And he was uh, acting as well in Iran and in Yemen. It was uh, schools for religious uh, students, for religious families, like a, a Mizrahi uh, variation of Chabad. Right. This is from Ruth Shane. Thank, ooh, Thank you so much, Professor Frilling. When will, when will your book be available? Are, are there any plans to translate your book into English? Thank you again from the grandniece of Rabbi Dr. Schwartz, our Uncle Joe. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, it will be published in a few weeks in Hebrew, and then we shall find the proper uh, uh, publication house in the United States, and we shall try to publish it in English. Yes. From Branca Arive. Why did Joe Schwartz leave the JDC? Why, excuse me? Why did Joseph Schwartz leave the JDC? He was asked by Ben-Gurion. He was asked by Ben-Gurion to leave the JDC and to go to work at the UJA. He explained to him that he, do, he did a lot of important works in the JDC, but it's important now to be in the UJA to, to take care for the money that the, young, the embryonic Israel needs for that time. And as a matter of fact, he was very close to the leadership of Israel in that years. People like Moshe Sharet, David Ben-Gurion, Eliezer Kaplan, uh, and others that uh, try to do whatever is possible that uh, Israel, the young uh, Israel, will be able to absorb so many Jews that uh, came from different places of the world. Great. This is from Lenore Weitzman. Can you tell us if any and how Schwartz helped the Jewish underground in the ghettos? That's from Lenore Schwartz. In where? In the ghettos. How did, how did he help in the, in the underground and in the ghettos? In France, as I said, there was uh, di different uh, underground organizations. You can find all the lists in my book. And uh, he tried to make one condition that they will unite or they will work together because it could not work with all everyone that, uh, and uh, the conference in Nîmes, they make a kind of, uh, of unity and Jeff Reuking is the delegate there, was the person that connected between him and them. Uh, so JDC, as I said, uh, since it was an American organization, it couldn't be identified with this kind of underground works. He did it by the proxies. The proxies, these proxies were the under, underground um, uh, movements. This was during the war. And this was after the war when this part of this organization were part of the um, uh, Jews that were active there 
to organize the immigration, the illegal immigration to Palestine before the state was declared. In, uh, in, uh, in Poland, uh, as I said, there was ways to uh, attempt to send money in different ways. One way was the TORS organization. And again, details, very detailed, uh, the, the detailed stories you can find in my book. Thank you. From Adrian Trapp, can you recommend a good reference which tells of how Jewish children survived in Spain, Portugal, or Italy during the Holocaust? Yes, it, it, of course, it can, it can look, you know, in the bibliographical, uh, bibliographical list. It's a huge bibliographical list in my book and find a lot of reference to these issues. Thank you. Um, from Ilan Troen, despite the extent of the JDC archives, is there something more that you would like to know that was not in the archives or elsewhere? Yes. You know, since uh, JDC Schwartz worked almost everywhere in Europe, in North Africa and uh, in Israel and the Middle East, I needed to go and to explore a lot of other archives. And I did it. Uh, so uh, the JDC archives is a treasure, but uh, as a researcher, you must know not only what the JDC tell about himself in these issues, but the other organization that operated with him. So if you want to know the relation between the JDC and the Zionist movements, the archives in Israel, the, uh, the Zionist archive, the state archives, Ben-Gurion archives and so are important. If, if you want to know about uh, what the activity in France, you should approach French uh, archives. Uh, in the operations, so the, the work that was done in uh, London, of course, you have to go to the, the National Archives in, in London and so on. In Romania, in uh, the archives in Romania, or in the documentation that uh, the archives of the Museum of Holocaust in Washington brought from different uh, places in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. And of course, Yad Vashem archives is another treasure of uh, this kind of, uh, of um, um, important documentation. But we have to remember that part of the story is, is the, the covert activity. Uh, this is a, a history of the untold issues. So you have to invest a lot of money to decipher a lot of things that people did that as much as they can that no one will know what they are going to do. Because, you know, as I said, uh, immigration was, uh, was uh, forbidden to where to take the Jews. The only the moon was open in that time uh, for Jews. Uh, the two venues, as I said, it was closed to send money to, uh, to um, uh, look, the, the war zone was forbidden. Uh, one of the main issues was how to use the American money in a way that you will not be against the American law. And in my book, there is, uh, as I said to my students, when they come to, to, to learn my courses, I said, you know, history, it's not something that you can do something with it. But after some of my courses, you'll be a, a professional in smuggling money to different places in the world. Because this was the, what done by the Jews during the war in order to survive. The question how to use money in places that is not forbidden to send money there and so. And I heard names of my friends that asked me questions as I said to them, thank you very much for uh, being with me in this presentation. And uh, I hope that uh, it was interesting enough. Okay, this is anonymous. Um, were there any connections by Schwartz with the allied armies in attempting to liberate Jews before 1942 when the U.S. entered? Um, I don't recall now something like that. Okay, this one is from Judith Friedler. My father, Morris Friedler, worked with Mr. Schwartz within the DP camps in Austria. Uh, wait a minute. 
were they involved with intelligence work during post-World World War activities? Yes, of course. I, I couldn't you know, elaborate a lot of things that, uh, but through the Bricha and uh, the end of the war, uh, there were connections between the JDC and the delegates of uh, the Yishuv that came and the continued kind of clandestine operation for, for example, looking after war criminals or looking after the attempts of the, of the Soviets to put their people in the, in the people that were part of the Bricha. So uh, yes, all these centers work for this reason as well, to look after attempts to use the, the immigrants uh, to, to uh, install in them either uh, war criminals or spies for the Soviets. The next two questions. This is another book. <laughs> the next two questions are about the same, so I'm going to combine them. Bela Haber and Phyllis Epstein, and they both want to know, how did you come to choose Dr. Schwartz as the focus of your research? Uh, in a, a previous book of mine, I, uh, uh, Arrows in the Dark, I met uh, for the first time uh, Schwartz and JDC operations. And um, I thought that sometime I will uh, write about it. But it uh, happened a miracle and a very good friend of mine introduced me to Miss Lolita Goldstein, that was one of the aides of uh, Schwartz and the wife of Melvin Goldstein. And they tried to find someone that will write the story of Joe Schwartz. So they approached me to a friend of mine that was the head of uh, Institute in Bengal University. And after they consult with other people that uh, if it's a good uh, idea to try to recruit me to this kind of project, and this is the result. I hope that they are not regretting. I'm sure they weren't. <laughs> so I don't remember now who asked the question about um, children in the Holocaust and being saved. And Laura Hobson Four has written at least one or two books about this subject. So you can look for her books because it would, might answer the question. Well, we're coming to the end. I hope that everybody enjoyed our program today. Um, I would like to extend my grati gratitude to the Jewish Book Council for co-sponsoring this event. I am excited to announce JDC Archive's new series for 2022-23 on young lives in turmoil and transformation, JDC's work with children in the 20th century. The first program in this series will be a film screening the Children of Shaban on Thursday, September 29th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. The screening will be followed by a Q&A with the film director, Lisa Gossel, and her uncle, Werner Gossel, who was one of the Children of Shaban. You can register for this via our link in the chat box and via our JDC Archives Facebook page. And I'm sure if you've registered for this, you'll also receive an invitation. We hope many of you will be able to join us for that. Please, please sign up for our e-newsletter if you would like to be added to our mailing list for the programs. And again, Tuvia, thank you so much. I'm sorry I don't read Hebrew, so I'm going to have to wait for the English translation, but I look forward to it. Thank you thank for having me on board, and I appreciate it, and thank you very much. Thank you. It was great. Thank you from Israel. Bye-bye. Bye. Shalom. Shalom.